how do you establish your own guidelines for the best way to manage talent in the modern day? I think it comes with older age and doing the job for a while where I'm very confident in my skills. And when I'm having an intro meeting with someone who's 19, they have 10 million followers. They've never had a real job before. They don't really understand how management works. I think oftentimes, especially if they're coming off of other bad management company, like this happens a lot where we have to teach them how the job is supposed to be done and how we're supposed to work together. And that does require setting boundaries. I'm not interested and there's no value for you to micromanage me. My job is to get you to trust me and understand that I'm literally truly incentivized to make your business successful. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the WIM podcast. Women in Influencer Marketing is a first-of-its-kind exclusive networking group made up of inspirational women. This podcast is where we explore influencer marketing and get real about women in business. Find us wherever you download podcasts, and of course, you can always find us at IamWim.com. That's IamWim, double I, dot com. Hey, guys. What's going on? Um, this is Jesse Grossman, your host of the Whim Podcast. So many of you listen though on a fairly regular basis, so I feel like it's like silly to say that. But some of you might be new, so if you are, what's up? My name is Jesse Grossman. <laughs> um, this is so awkward. <laughs> Anyways, you guys, it wouldn't be another Whim Podcast if it wasn't some awkward moment um, included yours truly is bringing it to you. Um, So (laughs) we have a really cool episode today. We just finished recording um, with Megan France of Whaler. So she's a talent manager. She has a cool tech background, uh, but she has been in the industry for like 10 plus years doing really awesome work. And so I was really excited to have her on the podcast. And the last time I sort of like saw her, Um, She was also speaking at VidCon and I don't know, I was like, I got to get her on the podcast. I got to get on the podcast. So anyways, it was a few months, I guess, a few months after VidCon, but we got her on. Um, Very excited to have her today. But before we get into that, I just want to confide in you guys. So I just got back from vacation and I have like the wildest story, like the wildest thing happened to me, you might think I'm crazy. So we went to uh, the Bahamas. It was beautiful. I had actually never been before, which is kind of surprising because I grew up in Miami, which is like a hop skip away. But I don't know. My parents didn't think I deserved nice things as a child. J- not joking. Um, so we decided to take a vacation. Paul, myself, and Zoe refer to ourselves as PJZ. And we went to the Bahamas for like a week for summer vacation. And like, guys, it was really beautiful. None of us had ever been there before. So we were like, all right, like, where do we stay? Like, we book stuff so last minute, you guys. For any of you guys who are planners, uh, my family would give you so much anxiety. We booked this trip like probably two and a half weeks before we left. Um, But we ended up deciding on Paradise Island in Nassau and we stayed at Atlantis. Now, I remember Atlantis from like – 25 years ago when it first launched and they had tons of commercials on TV. And again, maybe that's because of where I grew up in Miami because we were so close and we're probably like the target demo of like, come from Miami, take a nice trip, go to the Bahamas. But anyways, I just remember all these like commercials. And so when I got there, I was like, oh my God, it looks just like the commercials. That is wild. It was really beautiful. We stayed at the reef and they have like, I think like six or seven different hotel variations that are all part of Atlantis, but it's a really good place if you're looking for like a family spot. It's nice if you're just going like for uh, like an adults only type trip, but I would recommend staying at the Cove because they have like an adults only pool there. Um, Otherwise, like I would say that it's mostly for families. I don't know that that would be my number one to go if I was an adult. In fact, I heard, like if I was just looking for an adult trip, I mean, but in fact, what I heard is that Baja Mar, which is like newer, has a better casino, like better restaurants. I didn't go there. I've only heard stuff and watched a ton of YouTube videos about it. That's how we decide on where to go to vacation. But yeah, I would look into both of them. 
regardless, the water in the Bahamas is like the most crystal clear blue water I think I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, they say the water, the ocean is just so beautiful in Miami. I'm telling you, I grew up there, born and raised only to go to college. I was there my whole life. It does not compare to the Bahamas, like in any way, shape or form. It was beautiful. But the story that I was sort of like alluding to when I started this conversation, we very last minute in true, you know, Herschel and Grossman fashion, we ended up um, very last minute booking like an excursion. And, you know, there are a ton of different ways you could do it. You could do it by plane, by boat. You can go to Exuma. You can go to Rose Island. But the influencer one, I'm using that in air quotes, like the one that you've probably all seen is where you swim with the pigs. So Zoe 7 and we all wanted to swim with the pigs. <laughs> I'm not even going to pin this on her. Like we all decided that we wanted to do the pig swimming thing and the other stuff, like the snorkeling and the whatever, but like the pig thing we really wanted to do. However, I will preface it with this. I think the older that I get, I don't really like going to like, I don't know, sometimes zoos weird me out, like SeaWorld weirds me out, swimming with the pigs that even weirded me out. When I say weirded me out, I'm like, "Mm, I don't feel good about this. Like, I don't like when animals are sort of like put in a position where they have to like perform for like, like for humans. And like, it makes me feel icky. Like, maybe you know what I'm alluding, like, I'm not alluding to it. Like, maybe you know what I'm saying. Like, I'm really into animals. I'm like obsessed with my pets. And I just don't like the idea of like animals being mistreated, basically. So... We ended up going though and we did it and the weather was like the one day that the weather wasn't awesome, but we still were going to be able to go. We just needed to wait for like some weather to pass because weather passes really quickly down there. So we ended up ultimately taking the boat ride out to Rose Island to do like the quick version of all this stuff and we like drove the boat up to the island. And they're like looking at their watches and they're like, y'all are late. We did all this already earlier. All the pigs are like away. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Like we went all this way and like we're paying like a good amount of money. Like for someone who like doesn't even really want this to happen. I'm like, I mean, I want this to happen though. Like we came here, let's do this. And so they end up literally getting like one little piglet that Zoe picked and bring it out to the ocean so like she can hang out with like one little piglet and we can all get some photos. It was like really ridiculous. That's like the behind the scenes, like Instagram versus reality. Like y'all, that's what really happened. But the crazy part of the story is like, I don't know why this guy started having this conversation with me. What triggered him? Honestly, don't know. But like after we had done the whole swimming with the pigs, like he just started talking to me and being like, you know, basically like everything's going to be okay. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And he's just going on, but like being very direct about it. And he's just like, you know, I know there's a lot of stuff going on in your life right now, but like everything is going to be okay and it's all going to work out. And like, you know, you're so strong and da, da, da. And I'm just like, what is happening right now? But like for some reason, just very like not me, I wasn't in that moment being like really skeptical, like who is this guy? What is he even saying? Like, oh my God, he obviously just like wants money for me or like what is, what's happening? Like, I don't know. I like that part of my brain like wasn't active. It was actually, I was like listening to him. I was like very open to getting to what he was, to like hearing what he was getting at. And he just went on and on. Um, that everything was going to be okay. There's obviously something going on in my life and blah, blah, blah. And you guys, like this is so uncharacteristic of me. It's me, Paul, Zoe, and like this guy and like the, our tour guide. And I just started like tearing up. I swear to God, I'm like contorting my face because I'm like, I hate crying in front. Like who, who likes crying in front of strangers? So like, I'm not unique in that way, but I, I'm like contorting my face, like trying not to cry and let it out. And he's like, you know, I see tears in your eyes. And I'm like, motherfucker. (laughs) I just, I can't hold back at that point. And I just started crying. It was just so, it was like a really wild experience. And then he like kept talking 
to us like about that everything's going to be okay as we're like leaving too and we had already like paid the guy like we had already even like tipped the guy so like he didn't have incentive to I don't know make like a a spectacle like a show that we feel like we have to like tip him for like this is the skeptical part of my brain like after the fact um but I'm sort of like digesting what happened and trying to explain it and maybe there's nothing to explain or maybe there's nothing to type like to to examine it was just this like really kind of bizarre but like kind of lovely experience where like it was like a perfect stranger who somehow some way picked up on the fact that I had a lot going on in my life for those of I don't think I've mentioned it on this podcast yet maybe I did once briefly but my mom passed away recently and it was like a very complicated we had a very complicated relationship and it, that had happened like the week before I left for the Bahamas. So I was just like very much on my mind and I I don't think I was like had that like on my face, but may, uh, whatever it was, he like picked up on something and called it out. And I don't know, it was actually like, it was really memorable. I kind of wish more people did that. I, you know, I had someone today, I was on a call and, you know, she was introduced to me by somebody else and asked to, to connect with me. And that person is more of a friend than like anything else. And she was like, you know, I will, but like, I happen to know Jesse's mom just recently passed. So like now is probably not the perfect time. So anyways, that's how she was privy to that information. And we have this conversation today on the phone and she was just like, you know, I'm so sorry that your mom passed. Like this is the first time I'm speaking to this person. So like, you know, I didn't even acknowledge it. I was just sort of like parlayed into something else. It's really hard to talk about. It's probably not going to be something that I'm going to talk about anytime soon on the show, only because I need to like unpack it first. But I guess like the point of telling the story is like, you know, regardless of where the conversation goes, I just want us all to be like a little bit more human. The days that I'm like turned off by influencer marketing and like all the stuff that we're just like doing all the time and the like parts of me just get like a little sick of it. Sometimes if I'm being so honest, I'm certainly not the one who's like, I love influencer marketing all day, every day. It's usually when like everything just seems so stupidly transactional and so like simple minded and like people are just like using each other and like I just hate that. I hate all of that. So I had this experience in the Bahamas where this guy just like really freaking went there with me and he just seemed so compassionate and he seemed so like knowledgeable about life and the world and like I don't know what happened there and why he decided to like say this to me on that day because I didn't know him. But I'm kind of glad that he did. And it stuck with me, obviously. And I'm still thinking about it. And it's been like a week and a half, maybe even two weeks, like since we got back. And I would just like encourage you guys, like, I don't know, take a beat. <laughs> like, end your days a little earlier, start your days a little later, take a slightly longer lunch, connect with someone on, you know, for a few more minutes than you normally would. Like, I just want people to be more human. And if we can all do that, I just think that our industry will be the better for it. That was a long intro and a long conversation, but uh, I don't know. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope they took something from it. Anyways, we're going to be chatting with Megan. So I hope you guys stick around. It was a really good chat, really good conversation. I look forward to you guys hearing it. So without further ado, here's Megan. Megan, I'm super excited to have you on today and 
how's life? Life is good. We're towards the end of summer, mourning it a little bit, but have some travel coming up. So that's always exciting. Where are you headed? Anywhere fun? Anywhere good? My family and I are going up to Sea Ranch in Northern California. If you've ever heard of it, it's like a hippie commune that was built by Berkeley architects in the 70s, 80s. So it's like all these really cool beach houses that are super funky right on the coast. Yeah. Are your, have you been before? I have a few times. Yeah. My husband and I have gone a few times. It's just like where his family would go every year when they were growing up. My parents haven't been since my siblings and I were itty bitties. So it's kind of a reunion for my side of the family, but yeah. That's awesome. Are you going for like a good long chunk? Like, do you feel like you get enough vacation time to actually like enjoy yourself and be present? You know, with management, it's tricky because it's a bit of an always on job and I love the job. So I struggle to disconnect. Um, And with work from home and remote working, like it's so easy to just like post up at a beach house and be like, I'm working. (laughs) But I will say my husband and I got married about a year ago when we went on our honeymoon. It was about two ish weeks, a little over two weeks. And I like fully disconnected. And that was the first time I had taken such a long vacation and like disconnected. And it was great. I came back to like a thousand emails, but it was all worth it. So was it though? So I have a ton of anxiety. I'm like riddled with it. And I personally, like I just struggle taking vacations. Like I, I want to say that it's totally worth it. It's totally necessary. And like everybody should be doing it. But what you last said, I can totally relate to so hard, which is like, you go and you'll like, if you can actually truly disconnect, like then you do ultimately come back to like a literally a thousand emails. When I was in management, I mean, I had more emails in my inbox than I could ever even imagine. How do you really manage that? And like, is it just like, you know, it is what it is and I'll sort through them as I get back. Or like, do you struggle with that ever? Yeah. I mean, I've been doing a version of this job for a little over a decade and like, I've learned a few things, which is like, the more work you do, the more work it produces. <laughs> and, you know, everything feels like an emergency in the moment, but it's really not when you like pull back and and think about like the priorities of life. And I think like post COVID is like put it all in perspective too. I'm really fortunate at a company like Wheeler where quite a large company and the talent management team, we all work really closely together, which I think is a little bit atypical for management. Oftentimes I think it's like siloed. You're like running your own independent business under a banner, but like I share a number of clients with an incredible manager at Wheeler and we have like junior managers and assistants who can come in and support when we're out. So knowing that we have such a capable team also made it great as well. Like I'm very intense about like protecting my personal clients and the relationship that I have with them. But there's no one at Whaler that I would be like, they can't handle like taking over my client communications. You know, like I really trust everyone that I work with. So that helps as well as like finding a great team to surround yourself with. So there are so many management companies out there and I would venture to say they all have different styles of like running their agency, managing clients, et cetera. What do you think has been, if you could articulate like the secret sauce of what makes Whaler like a really well-oiled machine? I'm curious because, you know, something that you said br- briefly before is like, you know, we share clients and like, do n- I've not really heard of many other agencies doing that. So like, are there any other things that come to mind that sort of like is a different experience for you having been in this all for like a decade? Whalers, one of the first companies I work at where they talk about being creator first and they truly are like when push comes to shove and they love all of the creators that we work with. And there's like an earnest support there. And it's an incredible leadership team. And I think so many um, amazing companies and struggling companies really start at the top. That's where the culture starts. And we're very fortunate with our executive team, with the the president of Whaler Talent, Victoria Bashan, and she runs a really great team that's like the perfect combination of having all the resources we need to support our jobs and our clients, but still having the freedom and independence to do the job how we want and like not be micromanaging us. Um, and Whaler, I think, is really unique in this space in that we kind of have our fingers, you know, in all these different areas. Like we have the talent management team, which is small but mighty. And we also have a brand agency team that's much larger. It's also global. We have a platform team that builds a lot of tech for us, which I think is very atypical for a management company to have like a built-in platform team to build tools that we can use to make our job better. We have a Web3 Innovation Hub. 
uh, we have a team that's helping our clients develop their own businesses like product lines. So thinking outside of like the merch print on demand and thinking about D to C like a matcha tea brand or a lifestyle brand or a fashion brand, really what those things look like that are a little bit more heavy handed and require more support than we've seen for traditional kind of product lines in the space. So Whaler's really always been a little bit ahead of the curve in that sense. Um, in terms of like as the creator economy has evolved, they've really evolved the business as well. I love that. It's really good to know. I just feel like not enough people sort of like compare notes and like, or even just like know what other people are experiencing at other companies, whether you're like a manager or an, you know, brand agency, which what have you. So it's cool to just like understand sort of like what's working from your perspective and like the inner workings of like your, your team dynamic and, and stuff like that. Uh, just like even the structure. So I think that's really interesting. Um, I want to start a little bit more on just like learning more about you. I think our like our listeners really appreciate and like love to just get to know you a little bit better. So I'm curious, like outside of work, you know, you talked about like going to, you know, on a vacation, but like even on a day to day, if you're like, okay, it's like, you know, a random Saturday and I really just want to like escape from work for a day or like I want to like cut work at 5 p.m. and spend the rest of my afternoon doing fill in the blank. Like what is that for you that really like you genuinely enjoy it as a nice escape from work? Yeah. I mean, as I get older, they're looking less glamorous, less like going to happy hours and drinking and partying with friends. Although I did that in my 20s. Now in my mid 30s, it's more like taking a tennis camp or <laughs> playing pickleball, going for a bike ride. So yeah, I mean, I am very fortunate to live in California and the weather is so temperate and so great. And I grew up here. So it's definitely not lost on me of like how fortunate we are to live where we live. So really like doing anything outdoors is amazing. Yeah, I would say those are the three big things. Definitely like I think I got into pickleball before it like became really popular. I've been playing it for a few years. Um now it's like the fastest growing most popular sport in America, so I probably sound really basic, but it's so fun. If anyone hasn't played, it's like ping pong and tennis made a baby and it's way easier than tennis. You answered my question because like, so my aunt and uncle play pickleball. They like just recently retired and I've certainly have like seen in my neighborhood like pickleball, you know, like pop, like signs even for it, like popping up. And I'm like, okay, this is like a thing. It sounds silly. It's like the silliest name, but like I wanted to know what it was a combination of. So you said ping pong and tennis. Is that what you said? Because mm -hmm, it's like a wooden – Pat, like a bigger wooden paddle, kind of like ping pong, and then it's a wiffle ball, but it's on a tennis court. It's like half the size of a tennis court, and the rules are somewhat similar to tennis. You can play singles or doubles. How did you learn? How did you learn about it? If you're like you've been doing it for longer than it's been like a trend, like how did you first hear about it? Such a good question. I think it came out of like right when lockdown opened up after COVID, like looking to do something. And I hadn't played tennis before. I think the barrier for entry for tennis is a little bit high. It's so technical. Um, but there are a lot of pickleball courts around where my husband and I live. So we just started like casually playing and became a bit addicted in that sense. And like recruited a bunch of family and friends to play. And yeah, it's a lot easier while still being challenging, which I find is like the perfect combination of a hobby in your 30s where like, I want it to be fun, but I still want to be able to learn. I don't want to be bad at it right when I start. <laughs> I'm a Libra. I have control issues, but there's still like areas of opportunity to learn. So it's that good combination. Like I get frustrated with like golf or tennis that are like so technical. You know what I mean? I do. And so I, I really enjoy also learning about people's signs. So like how else – what are other ways that you are like a true Libra? What are other descriptors? I mean, my big three are Libra, I'm a Virgo rising, and then Taurus is my last. And so I think like those three are definitely like to a T very me. So like Virgo rising and very type A. I think it's what makes me really good at my job. I'm very OCD and like I never forget anything ever. And I have like multiple systems and multiple like – 
pieces of tech that I use to like keep myself organized and people at Whaler make fun of me for it all the time, but it's very like crucial that I feel like as organized and as optimized as possible. So that's very much the Virgo piece. The Libra piece, I mean, it's the scale. So we're all about balance. And I find myself kind of in that um, in between in a lot of ways with my job and my life and my friendships and, and all of that, like striking that balance all the time. And the Taurus is very much like Tauruses are typically like homebodies. So I even find like the Libra Taurus connection is interesting because I am a homebody. I'm very introverted, but also I feel this sense of like, not like guilt, but just I need a balance between like, I need to earn my time at home by like going out and being social and seeing my friends so that I can like earn being a homebody, if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. I hear that. Oh, like, I don't know why I get anxious when you, when you mentioned about that last part, like earning it. I feel like a lot of us probably can relate to that. And it's like, why do you have to earn it? Like, do you have to earn, you know, like, it's like, why, why do we do this to ourselves? It's the weird thing with working from home too. Like, I feel this weird sense that I need to like go out and like use my, up my social battery in order to like deserve rest. There's probably some like things I can work through in therapy there, but I enjoy like recuperating and resting at home more when I feel like I've like gone out and like really made myself tired versus like I'm already tired from the week of being at home. And then I just kind of like parlay that into staying at home. I feel like more of a like couch potato when that happens. No, I feel you on that. When it comes to guys, guys being in management and like what makes you good at your job, um, maybe your coworkers occasionally make fun of you for it as you're like a type A, like very organized, like utilizing tech. Like what else do you think as a manager – sets you apart maybe from other talent managers you've come across? Yeah. I mean, I have the really fortunate perspective and a number of, man of managers at Whaler, including Victoria, are this way as well, where we've been in the industry for so long. Like I started, I started out in TV more traditional, but I flipped over to like the creator side, the creator economy before it was even called that in like 2012, 2013. So having that experience of having seen the industry evolve over that time and also just seeing like the creator perspective, like I've worked really closely with creators in that time, whether or not in management, um, like in more partnership style roles. And I've seen so many of them like burn out or struggle to evolve their business or find the right team to work with. Um, so I think having that perspective has been incredibly helpful. I always joke that like ultimately management is, you know, a middleman job and you do have to be organized and you do need relationships, but like we all have the same relationships. We're all working with the same brands and agencies. So you really can't necessarily like promise more than the next manager. It's so much more about like chemistry and finding clients that like click with you. But I think the thing that kind of sets me apart is being able to advise my clients of like, let's protect your mental health. Let's protect you from burning out. Let's think about your business strategically in the next five years because I've seen multiple creators and their businesses evolve over five years. So I have a sense of like what that should look like in order to be successful, in order to accomplish your goals. So I think having that long-term perspective has been really great. I've been privy to like a few recent conversations. It's just like it's happened in, in a couple different scenarios and it's made me think. The conversations have been about that they're in these people's opinions and they're not here to speak for themselves, but I'll recap as best I can. That their opinion is that like management is – they're almost insinuating that like managers can be – predatory. Managers don't necessarily add to, you know, the equation. Like they don't, they don't give as much as they're taking, like things like that. You know, disclosure, I have been a talent manager. I like sold my agency. So like, of course I have a certain slant and I'm sure you do too. But like, I also remember the days when I was like pitching talent to work with. And I would say like, at least seven out of 10 times, maybe five, maybe five out of 10 times, a lot of them would 
tell me these stories about how they worked with someone before, they've had this terrible experience. And I was like, huh, it's interesting. I feel like I'm not only forced to pitch myself, but I'm forced to like sort of apologize for the wrongs of other managers that I have never met, didn't know, but these creators have experienced. I'm curious if you have experienced that yourself and like, I don't know if there's like a particularly wild story that you can relay to like, oh my God, this influencer had gone through that. Or you hear most influencers have experienced this, like what you're up against and how you combat that. Yeah, it's really tough. I would say that's something we've seen rise in prevalence over the last few years. I mean, the creator economy has exploded, but I think the thing that comes with that is bad actors realizing there's money to be made in this industry and, um, you know, figuring if they buy a URL, say that they're CEO of a company, they're a talent manager, and start going after talent who don't know any better, that they can do the job. And, you're totally right. It's a really tough reputation for us managers who have been doing the job for a while, who work for large companies where like we're held to a certain standard of work that we're like up against. And oftentimes it feels like we're kind of helping creators that want to work with us, like work through past trauma of other bad actors, like bad managers who took advantage of them. So often I'm so transparent when I'm meeting with potential clients where I'm like, you can speak to any of the creators I currently work with. You can speak with creators I no longer work with so that you can hear like why we parted ways. Like that happens in management as well. It's not always a bad thing. And I think it's important that creators do their due diligence and recognize that it's like adding on COO to your business. Like it's a really, really big deal and you need to know who you're going into business for. And, you know, people can promise the world and talk a big game and say that they represent people that they don't officially represent. You know, maybe they sold a couple of brand deals and now they're calling themselves that creator's manager. Like I really, really encourage creators to do their due diligence and get references and get referrals to managers that your creators trust. You know, in terms of horror stories, we've heard creators come to us where managers convince them to give them more than the industry standard which is 20%, or convince them to like pay off a flat fee, like a retainer model, which is also not okay. Managers that like promise these things and they're unable to follow through, or like they'll hear a creator will get back from a brand that they had a terrible time working with their manager. And because of that, the brand didn't want to work with them again, which, you know, ultimately a manager is an extension of your business. They're literally representing you. So, um, you know, although someone might talk about like being a shark and getting you the best deal, you need to think about like, what are those conversations they're having on my behalf? Because from the brand and agency's perspective, they think that everything a manager is saying has been vetted and approved by the creator. So, whether or not you know like how your manager is treating other people like i'm very much of the camp of like kill them with kindness the best brand is a renewing brand a renewing sponsor and you never know where anyone is going to end up in this industry i think that's come with a lot of time as well of like you know there are people that when i was an assistant they're now like executives at studios and um really important people and i've always treated people with respect the way i want to be treated and i've never like looked down on anyone or like tried to take advantage of someone because they have like seniority or leadership like i think that's a huge thing as well there's this weird like feeling, it almost feels like an entourage holdover that they need to be like pompous and they're advocating for their clients by like being super intense and like the bad cop. And of course there's aspects of that to the job, but ultimately you're representing a creator and I take that so seriously. So yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. It's interesting when you, I think we're about the same age and I remember you know, like the entourages of the world and like when, you know, that was something to sort of like look up to and aspire to be in representation, whether you represent creators or actors or whatever. It was just like Hollywood is, there's been like a real reckoning. I feel like we've all sort of seen it in terms of like the way that old Hollywood has been looked at. And, you know, it, certainly like it transfers into, I think, management of creators as well, because it's like, that is, that was the template of what Mm -hmm. it is to represent talent. It seems like it's good that we're, we can 
just sit here and be critical and all more or less all agree that like these are the ways that we don't want to be. But I wonder if there's a good enough blueprint of what managers should be doing um, that's really going to move the needle for our talent, the way to like really interact with talent, like how to um, draw boundaries perhaps when boundaries need to be drawn to protect their mental health, our mental health. Like who do you look to or how do you sort of establish your own guidelines for the best way to manage talent in the modern day. What do you what do you look at as an example for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it comes with older age and doing the job for a while where like I'm very confident in my skills and like I know a lot of people and have done, you know, so much work and I have so much respect for creators, but I also oftentimes we'll have to like when I'm having an intro meeting with someone who's like 19, they have 10 million followers. They've never had a real job before. They don't really understand how management works. I think oftentimes, especially if they're coming off of the other bad management company, like this happens a lot where we kind of have to teach them how their job is supposed to be done and how we're supposed to work together. And that does require setting boundaries. Like I'm not interested and there's no value for you to micromanage me. Like my job is to get you to trust me and understand that like I'm literally incentivized to make your business successful. I'm incentivized to want brands to come back and work with us again and to make you look as best as I can. So it's oftentimes working through that kind of like either past trauma of another manager or like just their sense of how it should be or them not understanding like we're not assistants, we're your partners in business. And we also represent a handful of clients. You know, at Whaler, we all represent between like eight to 15 creators. So that goes into boundary setting as well, where it's like, I'm not a full-time employee of yours. It's that kind of dance where it's like, I want to go above and beyond uh, the job to allow you to trust me. But also I believe in myself and my skills and I know I can do the job that if I can't like break through, if a creator is really struggling and is really trying to like micromanage, then it's that conversation where it's like, it might not be a fit for me. That's me personally. Maybe there are other managers who, you know, don't mind that, but I, I want to be able to have that like solid trust with the client that we can work together long-term and build something really great together. And if I can't get them to do that, you know, there's only so much that I can do. In terms of the types of clients I look at, I mean, I want to work with adults and that's not even necessarily like an age thing. It's like a mindset, like ideally someone who's like worked in customer service or like worked a real job and like understands what deadlines are. Oftentimes we're like having to teach creators like that deadlines are a real thing and like brands are working on a really specific timeline. They need to get a budget spent within a certain time frame, and really teaching them like kind of how to like professionalize their business. So creators that either understand that or are open to learning that um, is certainly something. And I really want to work with a creator who has a strong point of view and a, a unique way of thinking about their content and isn't just like following trends. I find that's more interesting for me, like having worked with so many different creators at this point, like I want someone who has like a fresh and unique perspective and really loves doing it and isn't just like following the thing they think is going to perform well. Cause I think, you know, I've seen creators that follow trend to trend and they just burn out and they like lose their sense of self. Cause they don't even know like, what's the type of content I like to make, you know what I mean? So that's a big part of it as well. I'm really, really fortunate that the creators I have now like are all incredible. They're all very, very professional. They're all like at the top of their game and very good at what they do. And like, I'm not having to like handhold them through like how to think about incorporating a brand into their content. They can really do that on their, on their own. And I can be supportive in a sense of like strategizing around their business, but they're not needing like a ton of handholding in terms of like why it is important that we hit a brand's talking points or, you know, what the metrics of success are for a brand deal, if that makes sense. And so I love this conversation. I want to sort of like dive into it more because I feel like whether you're like a creator and tuning into this or a manager and tuning into this, like both of those parties respectively want for there to just be success in like in the influencer's career, right? Because the everyone's benefiting from it in that case. So my question to you is like, what are 
even more attributes that you can identify, whether it's your clients, your colleagues' clients, you're like, dang, like this influencer is killing it. Like they are just, you know, con- like constantly getting buzzed. They're like on the up and up. All their stats are sort of growing. Their partnerships are growing. Like things are just really looking as if they are absolutely going to be able to establish themselves as like a long-term, you know, person in the creator economy. What are they doing? What are they doing right? Yeah. I mean, a number of my clients, I think, have a very similar approach to work that I do, which is why we work so well, which is they treat every single person with respect and they treat it really seriously when a brand is offering to pay them thousands of dollars. There's no like entitlement there. They really understand like a brand only has so much budget and they've carved out some of it to work with me. Like what are the ways in which I can incorporate the brand to make them feel that their money is well spent and it's going to perform well while still staying true to me. You know, oftentimes we're kind of having that dance where we're trying to help the brand understand the more creative freedom you can give a creator, the better the content will perform. But also on the creator side, that a brand more often than not is wanting to hit the talk point talking points about their brand that they care about and like wanting to represent their brand in the way that is important to them before performance of the content. Like they would rather have a video that authentically represents their brand perfectly than like a viral video that does nothing to kind of like talk about their brand and puts their brand in a a light that they don't want to be represented. And oftentimes we're kind of having to coach creators between like thinking about organic content and branded content a little differently in terms of those metrics of success. But, you know, some of the most successful clients we have at Whaler have really nailed that. Like my client, Emmanuel Diverno is a creator in the culinary space. He treats every partnership with the utmost respect and is very much like whatever the brand wants, I will figure out a way to incorporate it while still staying true to me. Like he really puts them first and foremost, which I think brands really appreciate. And we often see them coming back because they enjoyed working with him so much versus like making it really difficult or like really having like super strong boundaries in terms of like not wanting to incorporate the brand at all. I respect creators who have such a strong like personal brand that they want to, you know, incorporate partnerships super authentically to them, but it's a little bit of a give and a take, you know, and I think taking that budget seriously and respecting it, I think is a huge metric of success. And then, you know, taking the relationship to the audience seriously and not half-assing the content and like identifying content. I I think people often don't realize at least like a lot of the creators we represent are short form creators like on TikTok and they're making three, four or five videos a week. And you think about that in the context of like the YouTube era where they were making like maybe one a week, some YouTubers are making like two a month or one a month. It's such a different like level of production and just like churning out constant creative. I could never do it. I have so much respect for my clients who do, but they can do it because they've identified content, whether it be cooking or fitness or art, whatever it is, that they're so passionate about it that they will literally never want to run out of ideas. They will always want to make new content and they love doing it. And it's like the thing that they do all day, every day. I think that is so important is like, you know, it's still a job and you want, you have to be so self-motivated to do this job. You're an independent business owner. Like, I'm not their boss. I can only work on their behalf if they want to work. So having that like passion and self-motivation is so, so important. All right. So I have to tell you guys a little bit about a company that I absolutely love. It's called Oversubscribe. Their co-founder, Peter, was actually recently on this podcast. So go check out that episode from June 20th. But basically, Oversubscribe is a place where fans can fund their favorite creators and earn back on that investment. So if you're a creator or their management, you should totally check them out. The million dollar question these days is always around growth, how to grow, how to scale, And if you're a creator who wants to expand your business, but you simply don't have the capital to do it, let your fans fund it, the people who are already invested in you. Once the creator successfully grows their business from this investment and earns more based on that funding, the investor, the fans, earn from it too. There are lots of fans out there who would love to invest in their favorite creators, but they simply didn't know that they could. 
So subscribers now have a real stake in the success in a creator's business thanks to oversubscribe. They can help them grow financially, which will then in turn make the content better, the quality of the content better, which will accelerate your growth as a creator just because you got some funding from the people who have already supported you for years. I think it's a really innovative idea. I love it. I want you guys to check out oversubscribe.co and just mention when. That's oversubscribe.co and tell them Jesse from Wynn sent you. Hey, you. Thanks for listening to this episode. This show is sponsored by Women in Influencer Marketing, the best online community for the creator economy. You'll meet fellow influencer marketers, brands, and talent managers to talk shop, get hired, and even find a mentor. When you join, don't forget to check out all of our incredible resources. We also have dozens of masterclasses from the top voices at TikTok, YouTube, award-winning agencies, and women who are paving the way for us all. If you want a chance to network with a who's who in influencer marketing, just check out what it takes to join the membership collective. Visit iamwim.com slash join today. That's I-A-M-W-I-I-M.com slash join, and I'll see you around the community. And what do you say to those you know, like different parts of the equation. And so answer however you like. What do you say to either creators or even managers who are just like, I'm doing all these things, but I feel like I'm in a rat race and I'm getting burnt out. And I'm wondering like, what is the next step for me? Like, you know, maybe they're just feeling stuck. They're feeling stagnant or burnt out. Like, What do you say? I guess, what do you say first to the creators? And then I'm curious if you say anything different and what you say to managers. Yeah. I mean, for creators, we pull back and we remind them to think about like coming from within in terms of like the motivation and why they're doing what they're doing. I think some creators get stuck in this trap where they're like, well, the algorithm says that I should post this amount on this time every day, but I don't have an Emmy to produce seven videos a week. So like really pulling back and being like, you are like the arbiter of your business. You're the one like getting to make the decisions here. And like, although of course you want to be mindful of the algorithm, ultimately the most successful like production schedule content for you is the content that you will want to make. So really pulling back and reminding them of that, I think is important because I think they get a little bit too in the weeds and that can really like pull them out of the creative and like the reason they got into it in the first place. And then in terms of like talking to other managers, I mean, you know, ultimately we joke that like half of this job is business coach, but the other half is like business therapist. So we are having a lot of conversations of like how we can help our clients take a vacation, you know, understand that like if they change their posting schedule or if they, you know, don't necessarily like live and die by the algorithm that like they will be okay. We have over 10 years now of record that like creators can build long lasting businesses if they're making the right decisions and if they're in it for the right reasons. So I think creators lose that perspective. So oftentimes as managers, we're kind of having to have that conversation of how best to help them through those times and like how best to help them like set those boundaries and like remind them that like why they got into this in the first place. And like, how do you personally like manage your day. So part of the day, you're business strategist and business coach. And then part of the day, you're therapist. And part of the day, you need to like build up relationships, maybe seek new talent. Like there's so many different segments to the job of a manager. I have so many opinions about that. But basically to you know reveal a little bit of that i just find it hard to think that one person can be exceptional at like a million different skill sets nonetheless most managers are looked at to do a million different things so with that sort of expectation and correct me if i'm wrong maybe your creators don't have that expectation of you but if they do and you are sort of required or looked at or expected to do a number of different things like how do you plan your week, your day? Like when do you do certain things and like how do you literally go from one to the other and do you schedule it out? Like do you just sort of respond to the fires that need to be responded to? Like how do you really organize your day and your week? Yeah, a lot of it is drinking from the fire hose. And honestly, I really like that about the job. Like I like every day that I'm like waking up, I have no idea what's on the docket that day. And like I said, I have like a million tools that like 
make it that I will never forget an email, never forget a deadline. Can we pause? Because I would actually love to hear what are some of your like biggest tools? You're like, oh my God, if I didn't have this tool, I wouldn't be able to do my job. Boomerang is probably the biggest one. It's a Gmail add-on where you can basically make it so every single email you send will automatically come back if you don't get a response. Or you can send it where it's like, you know, a brand is emailing us being like, hey, here are our notes. We need the revised content by Friday. We can then schedule that email to come back on Friday and reach out to our client being like, hey, here are the notes we need by Friday and schedule that to come back Friday or even Thursday. And if we don't see it by then, we can be like, how's it going? You know what I mean? So it's a lot of automation that like make it so that I can't, like nothing will fall through the cracks. So Boomerang is a big one. I have an integration with Airtable to project manage like all of the deals I'm working on. So at any point, if a client calls me and they're like, what are my deals? What are the deadlines? What am I working on? It's very easy for me to pull up and be like, here are the 10 active deals. Here are the deadlines. Here's like the status for each of them. Another one that not many people know about is a company called Streak. It's also a Gmail integration. You can track email opens, link opens. You can mail merge, which I find to be super helpful. Like when we have a new client, oftentimes I'll send a mail merge to our agency partners being like, you know, I recently signed with another manager at Wheeler, um, Katia Chazaretta, who is the first Mexican born woman to go to space, which is incredibly exciting. And like, as we're getting into Q4, that's like a new client where we're, you know, sharing with our agency partners, like here's this new client. We have here the areas of business where she can really slot in. So that's been an amazing tool. But yeah, I mean, in terms of like kind of scheduling my day and boundaries and stuff like that, I often find from like 7, 8 a.m. to like 1 or 2 p.m. It's just drinking from the fire hose and like keeping myself organized with all those checks and balances I have in place. And then the like afternoon hour is a lot more like strategically thinking about like how can I identify new people to reach out to? Or how can I, you know, research potential creators to be looking at? It's a lot more of like research heavy or like data entry heavy type work because it's not quite so like constantly an email responding. And I find like boundary setting is better left unsaid. Like people will respond to your working style. You don't necessarily have to be so explicit. So like it took me a lot. Like when I worked in tech, I really struggled with setting boundaries, but I found like if I respond to an email after 5 p.m., I'll get an email back. It just creates that expectation where it's like, oh, you're not, you're still working, then you're accessible. Um, or if I respond to an email on the weekend, it's the same thing. And Previously, it felt like I'd rather just get it done really fast than wait till the morning, like wait till business hours. But like as I've gotten older um, and really learned how to set boundaries, I've realized like unless it's truly, truly urgent, like there's no reason for me to even respond and be like, I'll respond in the morning. You know, if I wait to respond, then that email response back won't come till it's business hours and they'll understand like they can email me, they can reach out to me anytime they want. But unless it's truly an like urgent emergency, I will only respond, you know, in the time that it makes sense. Totally. I think it's funny because I I know that when I get email replies back at like right at 8 a.m., I know that it was like scheduled from the night before from like another time because now there are great, so many great automation tools that like, you know, built into the tools that we know and love. Like now on your iPhone, you can, you know, long press the send button and it'll send it a different time and you don't have to send it immediately. You never used to be able to do that. So like if you want to take care of or handle a response now because it helps your mental state, but you don't necessarily want to actually have it. You want to get it off your plate now, but you don't want to, you know, start that momentum when, oh, now they feel like they need to respond. You can because you can use that iPhone feature. You can use, you know, Gmail has schedule send. So like I love that. That so much. I think it's a really my schedule send time is usually 8 16 a.m. Pacific time. So if you're getting an email from me at 8 16, it's probably I wrote it the night before and scheduled it. But I change it from 8 a.m. exactly so it looks super casual. Hey, wait, I love that so much. I actually didn't really, I mean, I guess I figured you could change the time, but I never really thought about it. That's so smart. 8 16 is your time. Is there any significance to that number or it's just a random number for you? 16 is my lucky number. 
And I like getting it out before like the nine o'clock time frame. So like I'm probably getting a response back like pretty early in the morning once I actually am online. Yeah, that's kind of the thinking. I love that. Uh, yeah, 23 is my lucky number. I was curious. I was like, why eat 16? Okay, I'm glad there's a good answer to that. So I'm curious. I want to pivot just a little bit. Like, so you mentioned briefly, casually, you're like, you know, when I worked in tech. So, you know, I know that you worked at a lot of really cool companies before coming to Whaler. One of them is Patreon, for example. And I'm curious, like we talk a lot about, you know, in terms of like strategizing for like long-term careers for creators, that the importance of not putting all of your eggs in the brand partnership basket. Like there are so many other additional revenue streams that could be really wise to invest in from the creator's perspective and then in turn, you know, for the manager as well. So I'm curious, like, I guess, A, what was it like working at Patreon? But B, like, do you see it as a tool that you think all creators should be using when monetizing their influence? Yeah. To answer your first question, what it was like working there, I mean, the task of working at a tech company oftentimes feels like you're trying to boil the ocean in the best way possible because we were trying to get like as many creators as possible on the platform. But I mean, the amazing thing of working at a company like Patreon, especially you know, there were no advertisers or our core customer, our only customer was the creator. So we could really say that we are a creator first business. And like everyone who was walking in the door every day was passionate about creators or was a creator themselves. Like Jack Conti, the CEO is a musician and a YouTuber. And like, again, from the leadership down that really like permeated the whole culture. Like there were so many creative types and so many people who are so passionate and really took seriously, like, Patreon is about kind of that like middle class of creator. And oftentimes people are making between like a thousand to $10,000 a month. And for them, it's like their rent payment. And like the Patreon team took that very seriously. Like we are helping creators pay their rent. We are helping them do this job full time um, and have that sustainable income. In terms of like, should every single creator have a Patreon? I mean, I think every single creator should, as you said, diversify their income because like any small business, it's super smart. And like, we've seen the brand business go up and down down through the recession, through the strike, through COVID. And so having a form of income that you can control a little bit more and having that direct connection to your audience and cutting out that middleman, I think is really important for creators to think about. But it can take a lot of forms. For some creators, it's a product line. For some, it's an app. For some, it's courses. For some, it's Patreon. So it really depends on the type of creator that they are. I usually say like any creator that has a podcast, they should have a Patreon. It's so easy to set that up. Jesse, you should have one if you don't. I don't. I don't. Tell me why though. Like, let's talk about it because I'm sure there are a lot of podcasters listening. So like, why is it such a no-brainer for podcasters in particular? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things. So the way that people think about Patreon is not like a Kickstarter crowdfunding model. It's a membership model. Like when you think about a museum, so like you can go to a museum for free and take in the art and it's amazing, but you could also pay to be a member and you get access to perks like events, like discount codes in the store, you know, like you get that one la layer deeper and you get to feel like you're truly a patron, which is where the Patreon comes from of the museum. And you're like supporting the great work that they're doing. So it's that same model where it's not like, hey, we need help making this project happen. It's like, you can listen to the podcast for free and it'll maybe have ads and you get one a week. And also we have this $5 a month Patreon where you can get the episode ad free. You get a longer episode or you get bonus episodes. You get discount codes to our merch store. You get invited to, you know, events exclusively for our Patreon followers. So it gives podcasters the opportunity to go one layer deeper. And it's like that sales funnel where like you're catching, you know, your full audience listening to that added like ad version of your podcast. And then the Patreon is like one to 5% of that core group where you can really kind of treat them like a focus group almost, which is so valuable for a creator. So you can, you know, reach out to them and be like, Hey, we're developing new merch. What do you guys think of these designs? Or like, here are a couple like topics we have in mind for the podcast. Like, which ones do you want to see? And it's that like trusted core group that's paywalled. So like not everyone can access it and there are no trolls usually. And you can like really, really build that like strong connection. No, I love that. I usually describe them as like your super fans, you know, where like your wide reach are going to be, you know, all the people that follow you on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, what have you. But then there is this really key group of, you know, however you describe them, but I always say super fans where like they can be the most valuable people um, that are, you know, 
that that follow you. And there are so many creators I think that just naturally sort of just like try to create content for, you know, quote unquote, their audience. But there are more instances, I think, where like you might want to actually think about creating content for that core group, you know, those super fans, whatever you call them, because those are the ones who are actually going to comment on your stuff, who are actually going to be moved to action, who are, you know, going to really like move the needle for your business. And, you know, from a metrics perspective, like sure, like flaunt that giant reach that you have of everybody that follows you. But I think from a business perspective, it's probably wiser to really focus on that core group because, you know, speak to them. You're never going to be able to please everybody. You're never going to be able to like appeal to, you know, a huge group of people. So if you can really identify who those people are, what they want from you, what they appreciate and love the most, speak to them and you'll really probably see like a significant, you know, ability to move the needle of your own business. Totally. Yeah. We talk to clients about that all the time. And I think sometimes they lose perspective where they just think about that big number where they're like, you know, if I could just get a hundred thousand on TikTok and Instagram, then I can do X. And it just keeps moving to a million and then 2 million. And, you know, they just keep kind of moving the, those parameters when really like brands, agencies, thinking about like the core of their business is sustainability is that like core one to 5%. And that follower number really doesn't matter. It's the engagement number. It's the views. It's the people that are coming back and are loyal and will follow you across platform or will activate, you know, if you're doing a tour or you're selling something um, like a course or merchandise or whatever it is, like you can trust that they will support you in that way. Like that's so much more important than hitting that arbitrary follower number. Totally. And so speaking of like the other places that you've worked, I know that you were also a head producer at the Shorty Awards, which I found really interesting. What are your thoughts just broadly about like award ceremonies in our industry? Because there, there are so many of them and I'm curious like what you think of them. Yeah. I mean, I worked at the Shorties from 2013 to 2016. I had the privilege of getting to run the influencer show. That's really how I got into the space um, initially because I came from TV as a producer and just kind of like randomly fell into this production job. But the amazing thing with the Shorties at the time was the market wasn't saturated. It was just very hard to understand like who were the top players, who were the best people creating content in the art vertical. This was like when Vine was a thing, like who are the best people creating content? comedy on Vine, who are the best uh, education YouTubers. Like there wasn't really that resource. We'd, we would refer to the shorties as kind of like the yearbook of social media. And every year we would hand select 500 creators across like 20 to 30 categories. It was, some, it was like a crazy amount of categories and creators. And we would then get to go to the creator and be like, we've recognized you for doing great work on the internet. So it was very different than it is now. Oftentimes now it's more creators that have agents and managers are paying to enter their work, which is how majority of award shows work. But it was a really like, kind of just like sweet, innocent time where like we could pluck creators out of obscurity and give them like the recognition we felt they deserved. And also like recognize minority creators, like whether that is across like queer identities, um, gender identity, racial identity, whatever it was, like we really had the opportunity to have it be like the yearbook of the internet and have it be like a very equitable, like display of who we felt was doing the best and not just like, these are the top 10 YouTubers like Jenna Marbles, Brett and Link, you know, who have the most subscribers. It was like, no, these YouTubers are creating great content and some of them have millions of subscribers, but some have 50,000 subscribers. And so that was a, a really unique privilege. Nowadays, I mean, back then our competitors were the streamies and the webbies who to this day, still people would be like, how was it working at the streamies? I'd be like, I don't know, but I can ask Drew. <laughs> we would get confused for them all the time. Now there's a lot more. Um, and I think it's great. I've always felt like this industry is under recognized, under awarded, and it's taken a really long time for people to take it seriously. And I feel like I was like one of the first people that was like, these aren't just like silly little teenagers making videos in their rooms. Like these are like 
huge like productions they're doing the writing the performing the editing the shooting like they're doing everything themselves this has never happened before like they're so uniquely talented this is a very difficult thing to do and i just felt like people weren't taking it seriously or like influencers were so often the butt of the joke and only in the last few years it felt it feels like they've been taken a little bit more seriously there's still of course some influencers that like make the rest of us look bad, I feel like. But I'm so happy to see more publications taking it seriously and more awards popping up and recognizing creators for, you know, the work that they're putting out into the world. Like my client, Emmanuel, won the Webby this year for the best creator in food, beating Gordon Ramsay, which is amazing. Like Gordon is such a huge traditional talent, but it's such an amazing thing to get to say, like a creator who he worked in solar energy before like creating his TikTok. And he's so hardworking and he's like grown a huge audience. And yeah, like he can be recognized and kind of be at the same place as someone like Gordon, I think is amazing. That's totally amazing. Yeah, I'm glad you are open about you know the fact that like a lot of these award ceremonies started in a certain way and like I think they're pretty much all pay to play these days whatever opinion you have of that it sort of just is what it is the main thing I just want is to for people to be aware of that because I I don't know that enough people are. I remember back in the day at the Shorty Awards and like attending in person and like with a couple clients and like the fun and excitement of it. And I know for a fact that it wasn't a pay to play thing at all. And um, it was really truly just about recognition. And you can sort of, like you said, like pluck people out who are just like doing really cool, innovative things. And it's different. I am the first one to say like, I understand and respect that it's a business at the end of the day. And so like it has to make money and that's the main way that it does. I get it. The main thing I just want to like convey, which is what you said, is just so everyone is aware that like most of them are pay to play. However, you know, there are people who pay and don't win. <laughs> so, you know, people do pay to get into it, but then they ultimately do have people who judge those entries and do ultimately select the winner. But to get into that like pool of talent, like you do usually have to pay to get in it. Yeah, I think it's tough. Like at the shorties, we were kind of the ones taking on that cost, you know, like they hired myself and a handful of others to select those nominees, which was not free for them. Obviously, I was paid for that work. And now it's kind of flipped where that cost is more on the creator. So some form of that is necessary because it is so saturated. Even back in 2013, you know, we nominated 500 people, but there were probably 2000 people to choose from. Um, so I think it's important to help like weed through. I wish there was some form of, you know, like scholarship or identifying creators who maybe can't pay themselves. And that's similar, like, you know, plucking them out of obscurity so that it's not the same, you know, hundred people who have the money to enter. Like I, I wish there was a balance, but I understand you need some form of like weeding through the crowd, whether that's the award show taking on the cost or the creator themselves. Yes. I think that's a really good idea. But then of course you're sort of like identifying like who quote unquote didn't have the money to pay and like whether it's like public or certainly behind the scenes, like you sort of know like who got the scholarship and who didn't. I don't know. I would hope there has to be a way to sort of like award such a thing like a scholarship, but like, you know, make it sort of discreet, but I don't know. And TikTok's made it tricky too. Like our for you pages are also unique to us. So it's like anyone who would be doing that process now, like the process we did in the shorties, I think it'd be very hard to have it not be like the bias perspective of like a 26 year old white woman living in New York City, you know, if that were happening now. But yeah, it's it's such an interesting space. It'll be interesting to see how it continues to evolve. For sure. And, you know, I think one of the like great things about award ceremonies is just simply like having a moment to like acknowledge people that are doing great work, like at its purest sense. I love that. And I would love to see that continue. I think that like it would be great if the playing field was a little bit more level from the onset, but I want to see them succeed and I want to see them figure that out. So I really, really hope that they do. It's been really fun chatting with you today. And I feel like we sort of like bounced around a bunch of different topics and um, I would love for our listeners to like 
reach out and to connect with you and continue some of these conversations. So what's the best way for them to do that? Please email me your big three and we can talk about it and what it means to you. I'll, I didn't get yours, Jesse, but yeah, I'm on Instagram at Megs France and you're welcome to email me as well, megan.france at wheeler.com. Um, but yeah, this has been great. I really appreciate it. Happy to talk anything, management, astrology, award shows, all the things. I love that so much. Um, it's been super fun. Thank you for coming on. Thank you guys for listening and we will see you next week. If you enjoyed this episode, we got to have you back. Check out our website for more ways to get involved, including all the information you need about joining our collective. You can check out all the information at IamWim.com. Leave us a review, a rating, but the most important thing that we can ask you to do is to share this podcast. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week. Tune in next week.